Thanks for joining us this morning. It's uh, great to see so many faces here. We got a packed room uh, bright and early in the morning. So again, thanks for coming out. My name is Daryl Daniel. I'm a mechanical engineer with Meta on the uh, infrastructure hardware team. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague Rich Banyard, uh, head of design with Rital. And today we're going to be um, presenting a proposal for a new frame specification called Open Rack Wide or ORW. Um, so we'll go over kind of a high level what, what it is, why we're creating it, um, what the key specs are in comparison to ORV3, go through the rack features. Uh, Rich will talk through some of the design and manufacturing aspects of it, uh, schedule, and then call to action. All right, so what is ORW? ORW is basically a double width, large form factor rack, uh, and it's based on the ORV3 HPR feature set, okay? So you're going to see a lot of commonality between those, those two racks. Uh, it was developed specifically for the next generation AI platforms that are coming up um, that need to support much larger masses for these IT gear, much larger physical form factor for the trays themselves, um, and ideally supports multiple generations of these platforms. Um, it also can support a much higher overall power capacity using liquid-cooled bus bars, which you'll see some other tracks on today, um, potentially up to 700 kilowatts and, and even higher um, using the adjacent power rack. So if we take a comparison of some of the key specs between the ORV3 HPR rack and the ORW rack, the obvious thing that jumps out at you is the width, right? We've doubled the width from 600 to 1,200 millimeters. Um, I mentioned earlier the capacity, right? The, the amount of IT gear uh, payload that you can put inside these racks is significantly increased over 2X. So we go from 1,400 kilograms in the ORV3 based system to now 3,500 kilograms and potentially beyond that. 3,500 is what we've tested to currently. We're looking at going even beyond that um, through additional testing. Um, the height is about 100 millimeters taller. I'll talk in a few minutes why that is and kind of explain why it's higher than that. The depth is the same at 1,219 millimeters, so that has not changed between HPR and ORW. Um, we, we have some new rack rails that were developed which have a higher payload capacity. Um, Cable management features front and rear. Uh, one difference in ORW is these are fixed within the rack. They're actually part of the structural uh, members of the frame, whereas in HPR they were removable. You could unscrew them and, and swap them out. Um, we have new cross braces, which are double width, pretty much very similar to what you see in RV3. It's just the, the width is increased. You can put those wherever you need to in the rack. Um, a lot of the other specs, I'm not going to go through all of them here, are very similar. The one at the very bottom I'll talk about, uh, we did add some top lift points to the rack as well to help with some of the workflows. Okay, I'm just going to briefly touch off on some of the potential power architectures. I'm not going to deep dive on any of these because it's not really the, the focus of this discussion. There'll be over other tracks um, eventually to cover some of this stuff, but I'm just going to talk through some of the potential options that, that we see uh, available for power connectivity since it, it is such an important and crucial part of these integrated systems. So option one, uh, sort of your legacy ORV3 approach, we've got a power shelf, a uh, low voltage power shelf in the rack itself. You bring in the 277 AC volts. Um, you know, in this, you could develop a new power shelf that's double wide, or you could even potentially leverage power shelves from ORV3 with an uh, adapter tray to make up for that width difference. Um, and then the power shelves in the rack deliver that power to your IT gear through the vertical bus bar on the back, and that would potentially be the liquid cooled bus bar. Okay, option two is a low voltage side, side power rack. Um, so you're taking in, uh, input voltage um, from that side power rack to the ORW rack via horizontal bus bar connections, right? So that's how you get power to the, the liquid-cooled bus bar in the ORW, and then that power gets distributed to your IT gear through the bus bar itself. All right, option three is a high-voltage side power rack um, with a 48-volt liquid-cooled bus bar inside the ORW. So in this concept, you're bringing in power, uh, high-voltage power from the side the side power rack into the ORW, goes into a power shelf in the ORW rack, uh, that, that plus or minus 400 volt DC gets down converted into 48 volts, goes to the liquid cooled bus bar and then gets distributed to your IT gear from there. All right, and then the last one is potentially a native high voltage DC rack bus bar itself. So in this concept, um, you'd have power transfer, you know, from a side power rack into a junction box in the ORW and then from there that power it's distributed through a high voltage bus bar on the back, and then the power conversion down to 48 volts happens at the tray level. So that's the primary difference between the options two and three. So let's dive into some of the kind of unique features between, uh, for the ORW rack specifically. So I mentioned earlier, we've got a new rail design. Um, 
One of the things that's increased, we know the tray, tray weight is getting heavier and heavier um, as these, these systems get more dense. Um, so with this particular rail, it's been designed to support up to 125 kilograms. Um, that's the reference design that we're providing in the initial concept. Uh, if even higher payloads are needed on the rail, that's up, gonna be up to the community to design their own solutions for that. Um, the second item on here is, is um, cross braces. So I mentioned these are 1OU tall and they can be positioned anywhere within the rack depending on what your rack configuration looks like, right? And so that's gonna be up to the, the end users to sort of determine where those are needed from a structural standpoint, and then of course validation testing we need to happen to sort of confirm that configuration. Um, we've got some cable grommets uh, in the top of the rack for, for cabling. Uh, the ones in the front are very similar to what you see on HPR. Uh, same size, the ones in the rear, we've actually increased the size quite a bit, uh, just anticipating some of these power and cabling options that we, we see may need to go through the back of the rack to get down to the power shelves, okay? Um, next one, we've got vertical cable managers, both in the front and the rear of the rack. I mentioned earlier, these are actually fixed within the frame, so these are not removable, but you're gonna see a lot of the same features that you see in the HPR rack. We've got lance features for you know adding cable management, there's holes for mounting cable clips and things of that nature, uh, but very similar. And of course, we have the liquid-cooled bus bar at the rear. All right, so here's a kind of a big change from the ORV3 based platforms to ORW. Um, Dan from Meta mentioned this in his keynote yesterday. Um, you know, as these systems are getting heavier and heavier, the, the flooring at the data centers and at a lot of lab spaces weren't necessarily designed to support these kinds of loads. Um, especially when you're on casters, you have a very small contact surface area actually touching the floor, so it puts a lot of pressure on that concrete. Um, so one of the decisions we've made here is to actually replace those casters with support bases. So we get a drastically larger surface contact area on the floor. Very similar to what you see on a lot of heavy machinery, actually. Um, this allows forklift access from all sides of the rack. Um, the base geometry specifically that we're sharing with the community in this kind of preliminary spec at least supports uh, industry standard forklift or pallet jacks, as well as some of the um, automated guided vehicles that may be out there. We have about 150 millimeters clearance from the floor to the bottom of the rack. Um, for some of those different solutions, whether it's off the shelf or a custom solution that needs to be developed. And then one key thing I, I really want to point out here is that this geometry is not mandated in the base specification at all. Um, it's actually not addressed in the base part, but um, if you look at the preliminary spec that we've uploaded, there's two parts to it. There's a base spec and then there's a meta design spec. We do detail this information out in the meta design spec, but that doesn't lock anyone to that specific geometry, right? If, if people have different needs for their infrastructure, you can customize that as you need. All right, and the last one I'll, I'll talk about before I hand it over to Rich is uh, we did add some lift points to the top of the rack. These are M24 by three threaded holes which uh, are integrated and, and mounted to the actual vertical structural members of the frame. Um, the hoist rings for this or the rigging is not included with the rack, just the mounting points, so that's up to the end user to, to specify uh, and, and get for the rack. But we see this as potentially just providing more options to the community in terms of uh, integration at you know, ODM sites uh, through that manufacturing workflow um, and then potentially even at DC sites for depalletization or whatever else they may be needed. And again, this is just in, in anticipation of these much heavier loads. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Rich. He's gonna talk about some of the uh, manufacturing and, and design for the rack itself. Um, yeah, thanks, Daryl. So, um, as I'm sure you can imagine, designing a rack, a product this big that has to support this sort of payload, there's some pretty significant kind of manufacturing design testing challenges. Um, so probably first and foremost is just the increase in mass of individual components. Um, so if you take, for instance, the base tray, if we were to just take the standard V3 base tray, scale it up to suit the ORW spec, you're essentially taking uh, a component that would weigh 16 kilograms-ish in ORV3, and it then kind of exceeds 45 kilograms, um, which obviously creates big problems in uh, material handling. Um, it produces or presents risks for, for operators. So the suggestion here would be to drive towards more automation within production. So utilizing um, robots, flat part lines, uh, and the like. Um, so not only does this kind of approach also reduce risk to the workforce, but it also increases process re uh, repeatability and reliability, um, as well as allowing you to kind of run lights off so you can produce more in a kind of like a short space of time. Um, one of the next ones is, again, 
down to the sheer size of these components, it takes up uh, a significant amount of space on shop floor. So yeah, the footprint of uh, 1.2 by 1.2 meters, it's kind of exceeding like a standard storage bay, a standard pallet. Um, even moving these components throughout factories becomes a bit of a headache. Um, so uh, yeah, what we were kind of driving towards is to have a, a bolt together assembly. So what this allows us to do is um, kind of set a maximum limit on component size and sub-assembly size that fits with current storage um, and factory layout material flows. Um, and there's also the added benefit with this whereby it prov provides quite a lot of flexibility in the manufacturing and um, supply kind of chain, if you like. So obviously you're shipping a, a whole lot of air with uh, a fully assembled rack. So what we can do here is kind of disaggregate um, the assembly process and the production process. So we can produce all the sheet metal components and sub-assemblies, get it all painted in one location, ship it somewhere uh, in much higher density, ship it to uh, somewhere much closer to the system integrator and have an assembly facility there that then allows you to kind of reduce your shipping costs and overheads. Um, and then the final sort of like big chunk with, uh, in terms of manufacturing is painting. So again, something this size, uh, it, it far exceeds the most of the um, sort of paint plant capacities. So we're looking, this frame is gonna weigh in excess of 400 kilos, getting up towards 500 kilos just as a frame weldment. So pretty, pretty significant. Um, so yeah, again, leaning towards bolt together assembly and limiting the maximum component size, component mass. Uh, it allows you to continue using existing paint plant procedures um, and facilities and not have to spend kind of tens of millions of dollars upgrading or producing new ones. Uh, so yeah, on to testing, testing and validation. Again, you can see there like the payloads increased from 1400 kilos in the base ORV3 rack up to three and a half thousand kilos. That with the rack on top means most test facilities that are kind of spec'd up and scaled up for rack testing are just simply not suitable. Uh, they can't handle the payload, it damages their equipment. Um, so what we've had to do is lean into other industries like the automotive industry, uh, the aerospace industry, obviously they're used to dealing with much larger, heavier components. Um, uh, and yeah, it's essentially trying to spread, um, trying to try and figure out who, who can support and in what capacity. So again, side impacting is a, is a real challenge on something like this. So that's where we're kind of looking more to the automotive industry to support with that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, on to the theoretical analysis. Uh, so as previously mentioned, the, um, the mass of the IT gear is three and a half thousand kilos. We're trying to build in a bit of redundancy when we're doing our analysis. So currently we're at 4,000 kilograms um, and we're looking to see how far we can push that before we see like material failure prior to uh, completing, completing physical testing. Uh, the materials specified are, are a mix, mix of kind of structural steels and standard steels. It is largely structural steel to deal with these payloads. Um, but yeah, like I say, we, we've kind of completed a lot of the FEA and results so far are looking um, very promising. So it kind of proves out the design as we have it is, uh, is capable of supporting the requirements of the, of the specification. Um, just give an overview on the timelines that we're anticipating. So obviously currently middle of October, we're looking for an EVT exit of the end of the year rolling into DVT for Q1, then PVT in Q2 uh, with pilot and mass production planned for the middle of next year. Obviously this um, timeline is very provisional and is subject to change, uh, but obviously this is what we're kind of gunning for currently. And then yeah, just to touch on the, the preliminary specification. So we will be sharing the Rev 0.9 specification so that's the, the technical specification and that's coupled up with 3d reference CAD um, and 2d critical to function drawings see this is absolutely in no way set in stone uh, it's very very provisional um, and any updates and changes will be kind of communicated through the the rev 1.0 spec release 
Um, yeah, so call to action then. Um, obviously, we want to get everybody involved. We've identified a number of potential challenges and issues. Um, I'm sure there's other people in the other areas of industries that can highlight more to us. Uh, so yeah, really kind of join the Rack and Power calls, um, join the mailing list. This specification will be discussed on the Rack and Power call in an upcoming call. Um, but yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. Do we have any time for questions? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I think we have just one or two minutes for questions, maybe before the next talk starts. Uh, so if anyone has any. Yes. You talked a little bit about cross braces. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so for ORV3, obviously, we developed some seismic kits for the frame itself. Um, for ORW, it is uh, potentially in scope. However, we have not done that analysis yet, and we haven't developed the actual kit for that. So similar to ORV3, that was actually something that was added a little bit further on in the development once we had the frame kind of more mature. Um, and we have plans to do something similar for that as well um, in terms of like what zone will support with the seismic, that hasn't been determined just yet. Um, we do have bolt down locations on those base supports that are accessible from the top of the rack um, in anticipation of that. And also, you know, certain building codes may require you to bolt the racks down to the floor as well. So um, we are going to be looking into that. We, like I said, we haven't deep dived into that just yet, though. So in scope, just not there yet. Correct. No, absolutely not. So the, the spec will kind of define, like say, with the critical function features. But yeah, if, if there's an availability for somebody out there to kind of do a, a traditional frame weld kind of assembly, then that's that absolutely correct. Yeah, that's not controlled in the spec at all. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.